So we're taking a look at some big questions, questions that have been brought up or um, according to requests from the congregation. And today, one question that we're going to consider is, do all babies go to heaven? The Bible does not speak to this question directly. We need to look at a bunch of different passages and the Bible as a whole to consider this question. We don't really have a direct answer to this question, but we're going to take a look and see what the Bible does have to say, and we're going to consider these things here. So Luke 18, 15 through 17. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So, just this passage here. In Jesus' day, children were cared for, but they had no status. And so when people were bringing these children to Jesus, the disciples kind of had a problem with that. So children back then especially, we don't have, this is not the case as much uh, for us in this country as much anymore, but most children did not reach their first birthday back then. And many more would not reach age 10. And so whenever there was a young child, there was a a risk, a big risk, in fact, that they would not survive. Children weren't idealized for their innocence or their openness or their trusting nature as much as they are today. Um, They were kind of viewed as just non-adults. They were valuable for what they would do in the future but for the present time, they, they were not so useful for putting food on the table. And so they were loved and they were cared for, for sure, but they were not considered useful for getting things done, putting food on the table, and so they didn't really have any, any status. So they were functionally unhelpful, and so because of their low status, the disciples kind of had a problem. And in verse 15, it says that there were even infants that were brought to him. Maybe you noticed that. And it's uh, worth noting that this word here for infants can refer to babies that are both born and unborn. Um, In in the earlier part of Luke, when um, Mary goes to visit uh, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth hears the greeting from Mary... Um, It says the baby in her womb, in Elizabeth's womb, leaped for joy. And that word for baby is the same one that is used here. So this would include unborn children as well. And the disciples thought that Jesus was of too high of status for children. You know, Jesus is way up here. He is is the rabbi, and and he is the one who, who... tells us what to do, and and so the children are way down here, and they probably can't even understand some of the big things that he's saying, and so Jesus doesn't have time for that. So the disciples thought Jesus was of too high of status, and it says they rebuked the parents who were bringing these children, and that word is quite strong there. That the word that is used there can refer to uh, scold, or command and order, like, get those children out of here. Jesus doesn't have time for this. Get, get them out. Go away. You know, it's, it's a strong, just strong word that the disciples are, that are, that are used to describe what the disciples are saying. So the disciples are pretty harsh, but Jesus kind of turns this around. And Jesus says, children essentially set the standard for entering the kingdom. This is how you enter the kingdom, like this. And unless you receive the kingdom like a child would, you're never going to enter it. And it's important that we receive children as we would the kingdom too. 
the way that Jesus phrased it, you can kind of take it either way. We need to receive children just as much as we would the kingdom. It says in Psalm 131, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. It's kind of this humble nature. I'm not going to try to go higher than where I am or what I can understand. I'm going to just trust you, O Lord. So children here set the standard for entering the kingdom. So if we're coming with this question, you know, do all babies go to heaven? We might be inclined to say, well, well, yeah. I mean, this kind of sets the standard for the rest of us, right? Well, there's some other things to consider too. On the other hand, the Bible teaches that we are born sinners. We're, we're born into sin. Sin is not only something that we choose, it's also a condition that we're born with. I mean, there are sins that we can do and that we choose, but sins are also, sin is also something that we are born with. So, for example, Romans 5.12, it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So, it's almost like when Adam and Eve sinned, then all of us became sinners too. The, the nature of, of sin kind of infects the rest. Or in Psalm 51 verse 5, it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So even when we're born, or from when we're conceived in the womb, there's sin there. We, we need a Savior, even from the moment of our conception. Every one of us. From birth, our hearts show a need for salvation. Genesis 8 verse 21, and when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, this is after Noah had come out of the ark and offered a sacrifice, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. So even from, from when we are young, there's evil in our hearts. Or in Job chapter 15, it says, what is man that he can be pure or he who is born of a woman, that he can be righteous. Behold, God puts no trust in his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his sight, how much less one who is abominable and corrupt, a man who drinks injustice like water. So each one of us, none of us are pure or without sin. Even if we hadn't made conscious choices to sin, we still have sin in our hearts. And so we, even, even young children... We still need God's grace. Absolutely everyone needs the saving grace of Jesus. Not just adults, but children do. Even children, it's the moment that we are conceived, we all need the saving grace of Jesus. And Jesus says in John 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So we all need to be born again, all of us. We all need the saving grace of Jesus because even before we make any conscious choices, sin is in our hearts. And so, every one of us needs Jesus. And for that matter, adults are saved by God's grace, apart from their works. How much, in addition, should children be saved by grace apart from their works too? So, we depend on the grace of God for our salvation. If you look at the Bible and how God works and how God brings his salvation to people, God brings his salvation through covenants or, if you will, contracts, agreements. So God makes 
promises and then he carries them out. And so there's different covenants that God sets up in the Bible, promises of salvation. And God's covenants of grace are for believers and their children. This is a recurring pattern in the Bible. That God doesn't just save adults, He saves their children too. So Genesis 17 verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. So not just to Abraham, that's who God was speaking to here, but to all of his descendants too. To be your God and their God too. So God, the way one of my seminary professors put it once is that God doesn't just save individuals, he saves families. And so to you and your children. Or Psalm 103, 17 the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him and His righteousness to children's children. So again, there's an extension of grace even to children here. And in Acts 2, Peter says, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus, the promises for you and your children. So again, there's, there's that. Romans 11.16 puts it this way, if, if the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So, children of believing parents, they share in that same root. This is why we also baptize infants in our church. We baptize infants and adults. Because infants are just as much a part of God's covenant as adults are. They need the saving grace of God just as much as adults do. And so they are a part of God's people just as much as adults. And so they deserve the sign of the covenant. Let's look at the screen here. Should infants too be baptized? Yes. Infants as well as adults are in God's covenant and are His people they, no less than adults, are promised the forgiveness of sin through Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit who produces faith. Therefore, by baptism, the mark of the covenant, infants should be received into the Christian church and should be distinguished from the children of unbelievers. This was done in the Old Testament by circumcision which was replaced in the New Testament by baptism. So, you and your children, this is how God's covenant works. And it extends to children too. So, because God's grace is by covenant, babies of believers are saved. It's pretty safe to say that. There's one verse in 1 Corinthians 7.14 that says it this way, For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. So Paul is talking to, he's talking to married couples. He's saying, okay, if one of you is a believer and the other isn't, that doesn't mean you should get a divorce. And it's also saying, though, if one of you is a believer and one is not, it says your children are still holy here. So even with one believing parent, if it's part of the covenant, your children are, are holy. I want to mention one more thing. This is uh, one of our statements of faith, one of our confessions that we have as a church. It's called the Canons of Dort. Don't really look at that one that often, but um, there is one part in there that directly speaks to this topic. It talks about the salvation of infants of believers, and it says this, Since we must make judgments about God's will from His Word, which testifies that children of believers are holy, 
not by nature, but by virtue of the gracious covenant in which they together with their parents are included, godly parents ought not to doubt the election and salvation of their children whom God calls out of this life in infancy. We ought not to doubt the salvation of our children as believers. So, it's safe to say that children of believers are part of God's covenant and that they're saved. And if, even if they don't survive childhood and they don't grow up to you know, profess Jesus as Lord and Savior, that doesn't mean we should doubt their salvation at all. But what about babies in general? What about the many young children of people who are not believers at all? What, do we, what about them? Well, this, this is where it gets more complicated. As for babies in general, the safest answer is we don't know. The Bible doesn't really talk about this directly, and so it, we can't really say with a lot of certainty about this. We don't really know. There are some things that God simply doesn't reveal to us, and so we just don't know. And this is one of those. We can't really answer it. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, kind of says it this way, the secret, things of, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. In other words, there's some things God doesn't reveal to us. And maybe there's a reason for that. And I think there is in this case. But the passage that we read from Luke 18, this seems to be about children in general. I mean, it doesn't specify children of believers here. He just talks about children. You know, even babies were being brought to him. So it's not a qualified statement, children of believers. He just says even babies were brought to him. And then he says, this, these are the ones that set the standard for entering the kingdom. So when Jesus was asked who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, he calls a little child and had him stand among them. And he says, unless you change and become like this little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so... When Jesus is asking who is the greatest, Jesus calls a little child in too. And it doesn't say a child of believers, it doesn't specify that, it just says a little child. So it might speak to children in general there. Another thing that the Bible is pretty consistent on is that eternal judgment will be based on willful disobedience which requires some knowledge of right and wrong. So on the last day when all of us stand before God and we're going to be judged, that's going to happen. It says we're going to be judged according to what we have done, assuming that we know right and wrong. So there's some pretty consistent way that the Bible describes this final judgment and it assumes that we know right and wrong here. So there's one passage that I think says it pretty well in Romans chapter 2. And I put that on the screen here. It says, He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first, and also for the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first, and also for the Greek, for God shows no partiality. So here, it's, it's saying that for those who are seeking the well-being, seeking good, and obeying the truth, it kind of presumes that there's some knowledge there. And when you are very young... It's, you don't really have that knowledge yet. So based on this, based on this, that, that uh, judgment is based on what we know, and that Jesus was kind of speaking about children in general, kind of an unqualified children, 
We might be inclined to say that all babies go to heaven. We might be inclined to say that. One other thing that Jesus said, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So it's kind of like these young children are, are first in the kingdom. So we might be inclined to say that, and I would kind of lean that way. But we do need to be careful here. Because not only does the Bible not speak to this directly, but there can be problems with making a definitive statement that way. So saying all babies in general go to heaven could lead to some awful conclusions, actually. All ideas have consequences. And so we need to be careful what, I, what ideas that we adopt, which ones we have and hold. Because each idea that we have can have implications for some other things. And there might be a reason why God didn't tell us or give us an answer directly to this question. We need to make sure we think these things through. So one awful conclusion that could be had if we did definitively say all babies go to heaven that uh, the first of all, the risk of rejecting Christ as an adult would make dying young preferable. You know, if you think about, you know, your children, your children are young and they don't know right and wrong, and if you, if you know that they're going to go to heaven if they die now, but if they grow up and then they grow up to reject Christ and turn away from God, then they might not. Then from an eternal perspective, it's better that they die young. It's not too difficult to imagine some, some slightly sick and twisted people coming up with the idea that, hey, maybe we need to actually kill our children so that they, we can guarantee that they'll go to heaven. People have done a lot crazier things than that. So if infants dying guarantees them heaven, then it would be better to die an infant than to run the risk of as an adult, having them turn away from God. Or number two, many of the aborted babies would be better off aborted. Because then, they're all in heaven. If they would have been born and, and raised, how many of them would have been raised in Christian homes? Maybe some of them would. But certainly not all of them. Should we say that they're better off aborted because now they're in heaven as opposed to growing up and learning not to believe and turn away from God? There's some, there's some difficult things that we can run into if we make a definitive statement that all babies go to heaven all the time. So, the Bible doesn't speak to this directly. And so we need to be careful about this. We might be inclined to say yes, that all babies go to heaven. But it, we do need to be careful here. We do need to hold this lightly. I think more importantly than a clear answer on this question is that we trust God here. There are two cornerstone truths about God that the Bible is very clear on all over the place. One of them, first one, is God is loving. God is loving. He is love. He is not malevolent. He's not mean-spirited. He's not vindictive. He's loving. Can we trust that God is loving in things that we're uncertain about? I think we can. There are certain things that the Bible speaks about throughout the whole Bible and pretty consistently and very directly, and this is one of them. God is love. And if God is love, we can trust Him. He's going to do what's right and what's best. Number two, God is just. He does what is right all the time. Not some of the time like we do, or even most of the time, all the time. God is just. 
In Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, the rock, his word is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. So, God is loving, God is just. We don't know all the answers, but we can be sure that he is going to do the loving and just thing all the time. All the time. This is what we really need to focus on, I think. Because even though we don't have all the answers, we do have this as an answer. God is loving and he is just. And we can find rest in this. So in uncertainty on something, a question like this, or in any uncertainty about anything for that matter, it's enough to know that God is perfect, that he's good, and that he will do the right thing, no matter what uncertainties we have. And knowing this can calm our fears. Because if the Almighty God is perfectly loving and perfectly just, then we really don't have anything to worry about. This God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all who take refuge in Him. In times of uncertainty or in questions that we don't have direct answers to, let's trust that God is loving and that He's just. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, we, we don't have direct answers to all of the questions that we have, but it's wonderful to know that you are a God who is loving and who is just. And Lord, because of that, we can put our trust in you. Whether we have answers or don't, whether we know what's going to happen or we don't, Lord, you are a God where we can find rest and peace. And for that, we give you thanks. Help us to remember who you are at all times. In Jesus' name, amen.